hey, guy with a microphone on a butter knife here, neoliberalism is often said to be the most dominant ideology of the world today. And yeah, that's pretty much true. Yet it's also quite difficult to pin down, so much so that it's sometimes claimed that it's little more than a vague political insult, or even that it doesn't exist. And that stems from the fact that while the average, reasonably politically engaged person could describe what some neoliberal policies might look like, or name some neoliberal politicians, they nonetheless struggle to articulate what neoliberalism actually is more precisely. So it ends up being equated, often erroneously, with things like free market capitalism, libertarianism, the retreat of the state, or classical liberalism. Such confusion is certainly understandable, since many neoliberal policies appear consistent with those labels. But as a whole, its theoretical underpinnings and its implementations are actually quite different to earlier forms of capitalism. So in this video, I'm gonna go over the theory, the history, and the effects of neoliberalism. And not just in terms of its effects on economic policy, but rather on all aspects of society. And hopefully, by the end, you'll have a better understanding of it. Part 1. The Birth of Neoliberalism the name neoliberalism implies a new liberalism, so it's important to go over how it differs from earlier liberal thought and when and why this break occurred. In 1938, many of the thinkers who would soon come to shape the future of liberalism gathered in Paris for the Walter Lippmann Colloquium. Named for American journalist Walter Lippmann, who had recently released his book The Good Society. In it, he posited that the trend towards more direct government economic management that began in developed capitalist nations during the Great Depression, exemplified by the New Deal in the USA and Keynesian macroeconomic management, risked leading to a gradual collectivization that would be the death knell of liberalism. Among the most notable in attendance were the German economist Wilhelm Röpke, and two Austrian economists Ludwig von Mises and Friedrich Hayek. And yes, I'm going to be butchering every single single German and French name in this video. Sorry. Thus, these theorists sought to construct a new liberalism, one that could remedy the problems of the classical liberal ideas that had led to the Great Depression, while also challenging the spread of state-directed economic policy. It's here that they coined the term neoliberalism in its modern sense, and established its two main fundamentals going forward. Firstly, they refuted the classical liberal dogma that capitalist markets were a naturally occurring, self-regulating phenomenon, and thus should be subject only to extremely limited state involvement, the doctrine known as laissez-faire. This is best illustrated in this passage from Adam Smith's book, The Wealth of Nations, released in 1776, one of the foundational texts of both classical liberalism and the field of economics in general. The human body frequently preserves, to all appearances at least, the most perfect state of health under a vast variety of different diets, even under some which are generally believed to be far from being perfectly wholesome. But the healthful state of the human body, it would seem, contains in itself some unknown principle of preservation, capable either of preventing or of correcting, in many respects, the bad effects even of a very faulty regimen. In the political body, the natural effort which every man is continually making to better his own condition is a principle of preservation capable of preventing and correcting, in many respects, the bad effects of a political economy, in some degree, both partial and oppressive. The wisdom of nature has fortunately made ample provision for remedying many of the bad effects of the folly and injustice of man, in the same manner as it has done in the natural body for remedying those of his sloth and intemperance. Rather than subscribe to this taken-for-granted belief, the neoliberals instead held that the market is a human construction, so therefore a strong state of some description is needed in order to ensure its good functioning. Rather than a state that would actively pursue the commonly stated goals of the economic policy of the day, such as economic growth, full employment, and social welfare, they instead envisioned a government that would be the guarantor and creator 
creator of markets, with few intentional policies directed towards any end beyond that. This may sound like anti-interventionism, but this is not the case. It's just a different type of interventionism to the one that that term is usually associated with. Rather than intervening to try and actively better certain metrics or quality of life indicators, the government instead intervenes to create markets, keep them functioning, and enforce the rules that it sets for those who operate within them. Thus, the common perception of neoliberalism as a borderline anti-statist ideology that is little more than a mere revival of classical liberal-esque free market capitalism is clearly inaccurate. Their second big departure from classical liberalism is in the prime virtue that they extol. Earlier theorists, such as David Ricardo and Adam Smith, had believed that the greatest merit of capitalist markets was their fostering of mutually beneficial exchange. This is epitomized in Adam Smith's famous invisible hand analogy, and by directing that industry in such a manner as its produce may be of the greatest value, he intends only his own gain. And he is in this, as in many other cases, led by an invisible hand to promote an end which was no part of his intention. By pursuing his own interests, he frequently promotes that of the society more effectually than when he really intends to promote it. So, the classical liberals were intimately concerned with getting results that benefited human beings. They were quite utilitarian in that respect. Thus, the reason they supported laissez-faire style markets is because they believed that they would foster mutually beneficial exchange that would improve the lives of everyone involved. As the French philosophers Dardo and Laval put it, with the general increase in average productivity deriving from the specialization brought by the Industrial Revolution, everyone gets gains from exchange. This is not a logic that eliminates the worst economic subjects, but one of complementarity, which improves the efficiency and well-being of even the worst producers. Certainly, those who do not wish to respect the rules of the game must be left to their fate, but those who join in cannot lose. The neoliberals, on the other hand, emphasized competition above all else. An illustrative description of this comes from the French philosopher Louis Rougier, an attendee at the colloquium. The liberal state should exercise power in such a way as to protect liberty, not subjugate it, in such a way that winning an advantage is the outcome of the victory of the fittest in a fair competition, not the privilege of the best protected or the best off due to the state's hypocritical support. The difference here is stark. One is a philosophy of mutual benefit that is intimately concerned with human welfare, and the other necessarily creates losers, and plainly embraces this with phrases like the victory of the fittest. Such a focus is profoundly undemocratic, as in a democratic society, the losers in such a system would inevitably seek to influence politics to improve their circumstances. Thus, some of them advocated for the limiting of democracy to ensure that the masses could not ruin the competitive market order with their political demands. As Rugier also wrote, democracies must be constitutionally reformed in such a way that those to whom they entrust the responsibilities of government regard themselves not as the representatives of economic interests and popular appetites, but as the guarantors of the general interests against special interests, not as the instigators of electoral one-upmanship, but as the moderators of group demands, setting as their task the enforcement of universal respect for the common rules of individual competition competition and collective agreements, preventing active minorities or visionary majorities from distorting to their advantage the fairness of the fight that should ensure the selection of elites for the benefit of all. They must inculcate in the masses, through the voice of new teachers, respect for qualifications, and the honour of collaborating on a common project. This passage advocates for any real notion of democracy to be thrown away, in favour of a government of elites who utilise their monopoly on violence to enforce the competitive market order, with the general population being educated in such a way as to cause a fundamental change in their mentality, to make them accepting of the new norm of competition along which they would govern their actions. This way, they could be properly integrated into the market and would be more willing to conform to its norms. These are not at all uncommon prescriptions among the founding thinkers of neoliberalism. Lippmann and Hayek both advocated for similar, with Hayek in particular later outlining his ideal government, one in which only men of substantial property
property age at least 45 would be allowed to vote and run for political office, with elections only being held every 15 years. This is in stark contrast to most of the significant classical liberal thinkers, such as for John Locke, who held that majority consent for government action was crucial. So from the very beginning then, neoliberalism was based around the state establishing and or maintaining a competitive market order whose winners, the holders of capital, would govern over the losers, workers as well as those incapable of, or unwilling to, earn their daily bread. Everything about this so obviously serves to protect the interests of the former group from those of the latter. Nonetheless, these theorists believe that preventing the masses from exercising proportionate political influence was required in order to assure all individuals complete freedom and liberty. These are words with many different meanings. To me, for example, no one who needs to struggle to meet their basic needs, such as securing food, housing, and healthcare is truly free. So it's important to clarify that for them, it simply meant the freedom to compete in supposedly fair capitalist markets. Therefore, they didn't see any contradiction between this freedom and a practically dictatorial government made up exclusively of large property owners. As long as said property owners did their duty and ensured the good functioning of the competitive market, everyone would be free. The idea that competition should be the prime aspect of social relations and the social Darwinist rhetoric used by some neoliberal theorists was not new. It has its roots in the writings of Herbert Spencer, a 19th century English philosopher. Spencer believed in social evolutionism, that humanity would become stronger if everyone was simply left to compete in the free market, but he did not believe that this would be thanks to mutually beneficial exchange, as most other liberals of his time did. It was because because the weakest would be unable to survive, which would strengthen society overall. He explained this in his own words in 1851. The poverty of the incapable, the distresses that come upon the imprudent, the starvation of the idle, and those shoulderings aside of the weak by the strong, which leave so many in shallows and in miseries, are the decrees of a large, far-seeing benevolence. Spencer's thought had some key differences to that of the neoliberals, most notably in the justification. They mostly justified their ideas by appealing to freedom and liberty rather than his notion of social evolutionism. And unlike them, Spencer was fundamentally anti-statist, believing that any government attempts to provide relief for the poor or interfere in the natural market would end up making society weaker. But regardless of their different reasons for emphasizing the primacy of competition, they both still pursued similar ends. The implication here is that the cost of the freedom and liberty which the primacy of competition supposedly provides is that those who cannot make it in the market will meet a dire fate. Spencer embraced that fate as a deserved punishment that made society stronger, while most of the founding neoliberals were merely indifferent to it, rarely even factoring it into their theories. Whether this competition was materially good for most people or not was only ever a secondary concern, at best. Part 2. From Theory to Practice Plans to make the Walter Lippmann Colloquium an annual event were scrapped due to the outbreak of World War II. But in the five days that it was held, the most important underpinnings of what was to become neoliberalism had already been laid out. Its agenda was continued afterwards by the 1947 foundation of the Mont Pelerin Society, which could be considered the very first neoliberal think tank. An initiative led by Frederick Hayek, most of the attendees of the colloquium joined up, including the aforementioned Will Wilhelm Röpke. Röpke is notable for being one of the most important contributors to the reconstruction of the post-World War II German economy, alongside others who are known as the Auto-Liberals. Note that Röpke did not call himself an Auto-Liberal, but there's very little that distinguishes his theory from theirs, so I'll be grouping him in with them for convenience's sake. He and they were some of the founders of Germany's famed social market economy. This is commonly understood to be a form of redistributive capitalism, as post-war Germany is well known for its very strong wealth welfare state, and in practice it was. But it would be an error to credit the auto liberals for this. Such programs had their roots in Bismarck's reforms during the 19th century, and the German working class was very unionized, meaning that overt attacks on social programs and worker protections would not have been very practical. In fact, the auto liberals original conception of the term social market economy meant something very different. The man who coined the phrase, Alfred Muller-Armack, a close associate of Ropke and a fellow member 
of the Mont Pelerin Society, said that the reason this market economy was social was simply because it encouraged consumption, which he described as a social service, and because the competitive order would enhance productivity, which would guarantee social progress. Thus, for the auto liberals, the social in social market economy did not mean social guarantees or welfare or anything like how the term is usually understood today. It meant little more than the maintenance of competition, which by itself was considered to be more than enough of a social good. Laval and Dardot summarized the auto-liberal position on such social programs thusly. In its auto-liberal sense, social market economy is an expression directly opposed to the welfare or social state. Prosperity for all is a result of the market economy and it alone, whereas the social security and various allowances allocated by the social state, doubtless a necessary evil but a temporary one that must be restricted as much as possible, risk demoralizing economic agents. The limited programs that they conceived of to encompass this necessary evil would only be justified because they were directed not towards providing people with their basic needs, but to help them adapt to the competitive market order. The conception of a government that helps people not to directly help them, but to help them help themselves, quite common today, was first popularized by Robke and other German theorists of his day. Beforehand, it was much more common for such government programs to simply be justified as universal economic rights. Just look at Franklin D. Roosevelt's proposed Second Bill of Rights, for example. Every American has the right to a job, an adequate wage and decent living standards, a decent home, medical care, economic protection during sickness, accident, old age or unemployment, and a good education. So, we move from the idea that everyone has the unconditional right to have their basic needs fulfilled, to the idea that no one has the right to anything beyond maybe getting a little bit of help to adapt to the competitive market order and earn their basic needs themselves. The basis of Rupke and other similar German economists thought was thus the two neoliberal fundamentals that I outlined. According to them, since a well-functioning market was not natural and self-regulating as the classical liberals had thought, the role of government is to remedy this by establishing and maintaining a competitive market order and ensuring that the population conforms to it. Thus, the German auto liberals were the original politically influential neoliberals, three decades before the global neoliberal turn of the 70s and 80s. Rupke saw this all as a part of a fundamental societal change. He wrote that an effective, lasting economic reform must at the same time be a radical reform of society. In order for the government maintained competitive market order to function, society as a whole would need to be made to adapt to it. The individual, the family unit, the government department, etc. They must all conduct and conceive of themselves as an enterprise embroiled in never-ending competition, and none of them should be the beneficiaries of any government intervention that is not primarily aimed at maintaining the health of the market. And while the auto liberals, despite their influence, were largely unsuccessful in totalizing such a model in post-war Germany, the more thorough implementations of neoliberalism that came later were clearly influenced by them. Another important school of neoliberal thought, led by the aforementioned Friedrich Hayek, was also quite prominent. Hayek was an economist of the Austrian school, most well known for its rejection of things like mathematical modeling. That is largely irrelevant here though, as we're mostly interested in his more philosophical ideas about how society ought to be. While both schools shared much in common, they nonetheless had one significant disagreement, which came down to what the government should do. Hayek agreed that competition was king, and that a good competitive market order was not simply a force of nature that could function without a state. But while others thought that the government should construct and maintain this order, Hayek took a more or social evolutionist approach. For him, the rules of the game that would create the freest and fairest competitive markets were to be found in the social conventions which societies would spontaneously create to regulate themselves over time through trial and error. These rules, once widely accepted, would then inevitably come to be formally codified in common law, law 
established in the courts through legal precedents. A strong government with a monopoly on violence was required to enforce these rules, guarantee contracts and private property rights, etc. But said government should keep its legislating to a bare minimum, as laws established through legislation are the conscious creations of politicians. Thus, they would disrupt the subconsciously constructed common law market order. Hence Hayek's aforementioned preference for an undemocratic government of landed, enlightened elites who would have the good sense to ignore the majority who might misguidedly push them to interfere in the market unfairly. In 1981, he even stated that he prefers a liberal dictator to a democratic government lacking in liberalism. While the auto liberals were at least somewhat influential in formal politics in the 40s, 50s and 60s, Hayek, at least in terms of his different idea of how the state should act, was not so much. But he was still very influential in a different way. As the founder and longtime leader of the Mont Pelerin Society, he was at the head of what quickly became a transcontinental network of think tanks, which were created to advocate for the practical implementation of neoliberal ideas, alongside business-funded university economics departments, notably at the London School of Economics and Chicago University. The most illustrative example of these neoliberal think tanks is the British Institute of Economic Affairs. It was founded after millionaire businessman Anthony Fisher read Hayek 1945 book, The Road to Serfdom, and then sought him out in person. Fisher had intended to enter politics to advocate for Hayek's ideas against what he saw as the threat of communism posed by the social programs and nationalizations being implemented by the post-war UK Labour government. But Hayek convinced him to instead use his substantial fortune to found a think tank, as he believed that this was a much more effective way of influencing government policy. This meeting would have a resounding effect on global politics as the Institute quickly became the most influential think tank in the UK, directly influencing policy from the 1970s onwards. And Fisher would go on to found many more think tanks, advocating for the same ideas, with his Atlas network today comprising more than 500 worldwide. As may be indicated from the fact that their founder was a rich businessman, these think tanks and others like them, such as the Heritage Foundation in the USA, are funded by donations from corporations and the rich and powerful the world over. Hayek never outright said that his prescriptions were meant to favour businesses and the rich. In fact, he argued that the absolute freedom that his ideas would provide would be for the benefit of all. Regardless though, the fact that they were so eagerly picked up, funded and advocated for by these interests practically from the very second that he had published them certainly indicates that they thought that they stood to benefit quite handsomely from their implementation. This advocacy must be understood in the context context of the post-World War II economic order in the US and Europe. Like the aforementioned Labour Party in the UK, many governments had implemented or strengthened social programs and taken more direct control of their economies than before the war, and especially more than they had before the Great Depression. This was underpinned by the global monetary system set up during the Bretton Woods Conference of 1944, which pegged the currencies of its signatories to the gold standard, set up international economic rules, the most important being free trade between member states, and established financial institutions such as the International Monetary Fund and the World Bank, with the former originally intended to be a fund from which member states could draw to stave off economic crises. This was thus the era of embedded liberalism, a relatively stable economic order with safeguards in place that made it possible for many of the states involved to implement the most generous social programs in their histories, with economic policy being guided by the pursuit of concrete utilitarian goals, such as full employment. This norm was also doubtlessly influenced by the desire to save capitalism. The Cold War had begun immediately following World War II, and most of these governments were worried that communist ideas would take hold if they were to completely neglect the interests of their working class population. This is clearly illustrated in the fact that even most of the conservative governments of the day didn't dare try to roll back these reforms. Thus, class compromise was negotiated between the working class and the capitalist owner class. Beforehand, the latter rarely had to make any real concessions. And so this also quickly became the era in which the working class within these nations was arguably the most powerful that it had ever been. 
but this power, however little or great it may have been, had been taken from the capitalists, who wanted it back. Hence the aforementioned boom in their advocacy for neoliberalism, as many of them astutely recognised that, whether it was the intention of the neoliberal theorists or not, extending the maximum of competition to all aspects of society would greatly advantage them and thus help to restore the power that they'd lost. This brings us to the 1970s. Part 3. The Neoliberal Turn the bread and wood system that had enabled embedded liberalism began to show cracks in the 60s, with stagflation, high rates of inflation, slowing economic growth, and high unemployment being widespread around the world, resulting in material consequences for wage earners that were one factor behind the famed global protests of 1968. This culminated in the USA abandoning the gold standard which had underpinned that system in 1971, and then finally the global oil crises of 1973 and 1979 would definitively cause the bubble to burst. Thus, the way was opened for a shift to something new, and the widespread advocacy for neoliberalism that had been steadily ramping up over the prior three decades made it a prime candidate. Its first practical implementation was forced upon Chile by a military dictatorship. In 1975, after Augusto Pinochet seized near total control of the government following power struggles within the military junta, which itself had seized power two years earlier, he brought a group of Chilean economists known as the Chicago Boys in. They were dubbed as such because they had been trained at the aforementioned University of Chicago as part of a US government funded program to counteract leftist influence in Latin America. These economists then came to dominate the economics department at the deeply conservative Catholic University of Santiago, with the help of funding from the Chilean business class. A part of that campaign campaign that had led to the coup against the democratically elected socialist president, Salvador Allende. It was, however, not Hayek who trained them in Chicago. It was Milton Friedman. Friedman was an American economist and another member of the Mont Pelerin Society who became prominent in the 1960s through his advocacy for neoliberalism in the US, and who eventually came to replace Hayek as the Chicago school's most prominent economist. While highly influenced by Hayek, Friedman's concept of neoliberalism was more in line with Ropke's. He emphasised that the state needs to take an active role in shaping the competitive market order. He laid this out very clearly in his 1951 paper, Neoliberalism and its Prospects. Neoliberalism would accept the 19th century liberal emphasis on the fundamental importance of the individual, but it would substitute for the 19th century goal of laissez-faire, as a means to this end, the goal of the competitive order. It would seek to use competition among producers to protect consumers from exploitation, competition among employers to protect workers and owners of property, and competition among consumers to protect the enterprises themselves. The state would police the system, establish conditions favourable to competition and prevent monopoly, provide a stable monetary framework, and relieve acute misery and distress. The citizens would be protected against the state by the existence of a free private market, and against one another by the preservation of competition. Friedman made a number of policy prescriptions which were implemented to their fullest in Chile, thanks largely to its lack of the pesky inconvenience known as democracy. The theorised perfect competitive market order was established there to possibly the greatest extent that it has been anywhere in the world thus far, aside from perhaps in occupied Iraq by the US following the Second Iraq War. Practically every sector in the country was swiftly turned into a competitive market, with most forms of controls being relaxed, and most state industries being privatised, sans the copper industry, which remained nationalised in order to fund the state. International trade was opened up, and foreign companies were allowed to extract profits without limit. Here's some of the most notable examples of specific policies. The pension system was privatised. A new market was therefore formed of companies competing to invest workers' retirement savings, which the workers have no choice but to engage in as such saving is mandatory. This system has, however, 
not been very good for anyone aside from those companies, as more than 80% of retirees only have pensions worth $400 a month, which is far below the cost of living and less than minimum wage. Widespread dislike of this system has been a factor in many protest movements, most recently in late 2019. In the education sector, Milton Friedman's most famous policy idea was implemented, a school voucher system, where the state gives every family a funding voucher with which allows them to choose which school their children should attend, rather than the more common system of public school catchments where only those who live nearby can attend. Thus, schools must now compete for students, with the government fully subsidizing the creation of a new competitive market that did not previously exist at all. A great example of how neoliberalism is not remotely against government spending, provided that it's done in a way that furthers the principle of competition. As a result, from from 1973 to 2014, the percentage of students in public education went from 80% to just 40%, and Chile now has the most socio-economically segregated school system in the OECD. The previously universal healthcare system was also privatized, creating two more competitive markets, one in private healthcare provision and the other in private insurance. Both industries, much like that of the aforementioned pension industry, were funded through coercive measures imposed by the state. Workers are legally obliged to set aside a portion of their wage to contribute to a for-profit health insurance fund, which the insurance companies then use to pay private hospitals for their care. This is another example of a by-the-book neoliberal policy. The state forces everyday workers to fund new competitive industries, which, as the theory goes, actually increases freedom since more market competition equals more freedom. That workers are quite literally forced to finance these new markets is not an issue of restrained freedom, according to neoliberal doctrine, due to the incredibly narrow conception that it has of the term. This competition shifted the focus of the healthcare system from overall public health, with an emphasis on primary care and preventative medicine, to profit-driven curative medicine. Whatever macroeconomic benefits this prototypical implementation of neoliberalism may have had were short-lived. By the end of Pinochet's reign in 1989, poverty had risen from 28% to 42%, extreme poverty from 9% to 12%, and the daily caloric intake of the bottom 20% of income earners fell from 1,925 to 1,474. What these reforms did accomplish, however, was to shift the nation's distribution of wealth in favour of the rich. In 1969, the income share of the wealthiest fifths of the Chilean population was 44.5%, as compared with 7.6% for the poorest fifth. By 1988, that ratio was 54.6% to 4.4%. Pinochet also banned trade unions and made strikes illegal. These were pers- descriptions that originated with Hayek himself, as one of his most enduring legacies is his idea that unions are one of the biggest barriers to the good functioning of competitive markets. According to him, they aim to gain unfair benefits for workers by coercing employers and politicians with their collective power, rather than by earning them through market competition. Thus, the restoration of class power to the owners of capital went beyond simple wealth redistribution. The very structures of working class power were also dismantled. Whether the theorists had intended it or not, their ideology had been proven, in practice, to suit elite interests very well. And others took note, the most famous among them being President Ronald Reagan in the US and Prime Minister Margaret Thatcher in the UK. Both conservatives, their policy positions were heavily influenced by the aforementioned neoliberal think tanks, the Heritage Foundation for Reagan and the Institute of Economic Affairs for Thatcher. Side note, the Affordable Care Act in the US, the celebrated, supposedly progressive healthcare policy of President Obama, is actually a very neoliberal policy, originally conceived by the same Heritage Foundation who provided Reagan with most of his platform. Thatcher was a follower of Hayek herself. In 1981, she stated that, I am a great admirer of Professor Hayek. These two, however, operated in countries that were at least nominally democratic so they could not simply implement neoliberal reforms wholesale, as was possible under Chile's dictatorship. 
Thatcher, for example, would have committed political suicide if she had proceeded with privatising the UK's public healthcare system, so they altered their rhetoric to compensate. The government was too big, it spent too much, it had too much authority, and it needed to be made smaller for the good of all. In practice, this was not the true aim. It was simply a strategy to legitimise the normalisation of generalised competition, an endeavour which was often implemented and funded by the government itself, as in Chile. A slew of privatisations followed, creating new competitive markets. Social programs were either gutted due to being incompatible with the competitive market order, or reorientated towards integrating individuals into it, and both did their very best to crush the power of unions, though they were not able to ban them outright as Pinochet had. Thatcher, in particular, introduced competition into practically every sphere that she got her hands on, often in ways that may not be so immediately obvious. Public services, for example, were reorganised along competitive lines. They were divided into different independent agencies that were made to compete with one another, each trying to justify its budget and existence by attracting the most consumers. Even when pragmatic concerns meant that involving the private sector was not possible, there were still ways in which the competitive principle could be implemented, and when private companies were involved, the state would be made to compete with them. One example is the introduction of compulsory competitive tendering, a system by which most local services had to be put up for open bids, with contracts awarded based on value for money. This meant that local governments, who would usually conceive of, implement, and run municipal services themselves, things like garbage collection for example, would now have to compete for for the privilege of actually running their own services with private companies. This inevitably led to these local authorities being reorganised along competitive lines. But perhaps her most celebrated policy was the rent-to-buy scheme. Public housing was sold to its tenants at a big discount, in what, on the surface, may seem like an excellent policy with no ulterior motives. You know, people owning their own homes, what's not to like? But the goal of this policy was not so simply to house people. As you may have guessed already, it had a whole lot more to do with fostering competition. Part of the money from each sale went to the local governments who had built and maintained said houses, but they were prohibited from using that money to build more. Thus, the actual intent of this policy was to cut into the stock of social housing, and thus reduce it as much as possible, as such government-provided subsidised rentals constitute an anti-competitive intervention in the market, rather than being passed on to a new tenant with government subsidised rent once the previous one left, these houses would instead be in private hands and eventually be rented or sold on the private market just like any others. An excellent example of how neoliberalisation can actually be quite insidious. Similar competition focused reforms were instituted in many other countries through the 70s, 80s and 90s, not just in the so called global north but also in the Global South. In the latter, however, they were usually imposed by force, such as through military dictatorships or through coercive measures taken by international financial institutions, such as the IMF and World Bank. After 1982, with the Bretton Woods system long dead, these institutions drastically changed direction and became the harbingers of the new neoliberal order. Their bailouts and loans, which many countries needed after the crisis fueled 70s and 80s, started to come with conditions that the receiving countries imposed competitive market reforms, much like those that were implemented in Chile, Britain and the US, often with disastrous consequences. In addition, they were made to open up their economies to international trade and submit to participation in the new neoliberal international order, one which would later be solidified by the 1995 founding of the World Trade Organization. Thus, even countries themselves have begun to conduct themselves as competitive enterprises, whose primary concern is to attract investors and ensure them returns. All of this has also coincided with the rapid financialization of capital. A huge power shift occurred. Productive capital, as in businesses that seek to profit from production or extraction, became far less important compared to finance capital, enterprises that seek to profit from investments in things like stocks. This shift was so significant that the very every line between such enterprises has become muddied. Nowadays, even most big companies which are traditionally associated with production 
men are now also heavily involved in the finance industry and often gain more of their profits through the latter. In 1983, the total global daily turnover of financial transactions was 2.3 billion US dollars. By 2001, only 18 years later, this had increased to 130 billion. This represented an annual turnover of 40 trillion, which is more than 40 times the estimated 800 billion that it would have cost to support all yearly international trade and productive investments. That means that only 2.5% of annual turnover globally is actually doing anything materially useful. This shift was enabled by policy decisions. Neoliberalism obviously mandates that, just like in all other spheres, financial markets must too be opened up to the principle of competition. And after the crises of the 70s and 80s, and the collapse of Bretton Woods, financial capital received a huge boost, as states turned to the financing of public debt more than ever before. This rapid financialization, in turn, had a drastic effect on how businesses themselves are managed. Investors quickly became much more powerful, and enterprises became much more accountable to them as a result. So they began to judge their success more by shareholder returns than ever before. Thus, businesses from the top down are now structured around this goal, and the principle of generalized competition has been introduced within them to facilitate it. Competition between individual workers managers, teams, all of whom are held to individualized goals based on company performance in financial markets, and punished or rewarded through now widespread practices such as individualized wages. Part 4. Neoliberal Society while neoliberalism had, at first, mostly been adopted by right-wing politicians and business advocacy groups who found that it fit quite nicely with their pre-existing aims, it quickly became so all-encompassing, its logic so difficult to escape, that neoliberal principles were also accepted by much of what I will call the liberal left, the Labour parties of the UK and Australia, the Socialist Party of France, factions of Peronists in Argentina, the Social Democratic Party of Germany, the list goes on. Almost everywhere, most parliamentary leftists, or whatever you want to call these sorts of social democratic types, started to speak, think, and act like the conservative neoliberals in Chile, the US and the UK had been, though with a key difference in their tendency to spin the primacy of competition as good for social justice, more so than the freedom emphasized by the original neoliberals, or the personal responsibility ethos of Reagan and Thatcher. Blairism in the UK is the most obvious example. Tony Blair's Labour Party was elected in 1997 after nearly 20 years of Thatcherism, and then proceeded to continue Thatcher's program, with little change aside from the aforementioned shift in rhetoric. This is best illustrated in the document that Blair co-authored in 1998 with Gerhard Schroeder, then the Chancellor of Germany from the Social Democratic Party, called the Third Way. This was couched in the rhetoric of social justice, for example in this passage. The imperatives of social justice are more than the distribution of cash transfers. Our objective is the widening of equality of opportunity, regardless of race, age or disability to fight social exclusion and ensure equality between men and women. Nothing there is out of line with the foundational principles of neoliberalism. Widening equality of opportunity and fighting social exclusion are little more than sugar-coated ways of saying integrating individuals into the competitive market order. Hence the new focus on workfare, pioneered in the UK and Germany, where welfare benefits increasingly became tied to obligations such as looking for a job, agreeing to increase one's human capital through submitting to training programs, or even outright being forced to work for private companies for far below minimum wage, like in the Work for the Doll program in Australia. The government, according to neoliberal theory, is right to take on the role of instilling competitive principles in the populace and helping them to integrate into the market, while those who are deemed unfit even to benefit from such programs are simply to be abandoned, and 
then imprisoned if said abandonment leads to them causing trouble. Other parts of the document make clearer its wholesale acceptance of the key principles of neoliberalism, such as this passage in which Thatcher's competitive reforms to public services were embraced. Constraints on tax and spend force radical modernization of the public sector and reform of public services to achieve better value for money. The public sector must actually serve the citizen, which it didn't apparently do before, we do not hesitate to promote the concepts of efficiency, competition, and high performance. And the first part of the program, where they make their acceptance of generalized competition clear. Product market competition and open trade is essential to stimulate productivity and growth. Whatever difference there is in rhetoric between so-called right and left neoliberals, as well as between them and the original theorists, they all simply justify similar ends in different ways. As Dardo and Laval wrote, the modern left's policy is to help individuals to help themselves. That is, to cope in a general competition that itself goes unquestioned. This is conveyed in its discourse by the reintroduction of categories peculiar to the competitive representation of the social bond, human capital, equality of opportunity, individual responsibility, and so forth, at the expense of an alternative conception of the social bond based on greater solidarity and objectives of real equality. Social democratic supporters of the third way no longer defend the idea that the citizen must be protected by the state, instead their goal is to create the conditions enabling individuals to reach a higher standard of living through their own efforts. The effect of this near all-encompassing centering of competition are can consensus for which is still shared across nearly the entire mainstream political spectrum was not simply material. It fundamentally changed the way that practically every individual, every family, every institution, every enterprise, every government department, every politician, etc etc, conceives of themselves and governs themselves. The exact sort of shift that the original neoliberal theorists and that Thatcher herself made no secret of seeking to. In 1988, she famously said that economics are the method, the object is to change the soul. I don't mean to imply that there's some sort of conspiracy at play here. Most every political ideology seeks to change the way that people and institutions relate to themselves and others. What makes neoliberalism unique is the incredible degree to which it has succeeded and the speed at which it has done so, to the point that even its professed opponents often cannot escape its logic, often justifying their goals with assurances that they do not pose a threat to market competition or that they would help to spur it, for example. I've gone over some examples of how neoliberalism changed the way that governments, politicians, social programs, and even businesses operate. But what about its effects on us as human beings? With the norm of competition so universalized, our governments doing everything they possibly can to instill it in every sphere, it's inevitable that this would affect individuals too, thus both directly through initiatives like the aforementioned state programs designed to integrate individuals into the market, and indirectly through our everyday interactions with the all-encompassing, globalized, competitive order, our conduct has changed. Not only are we considered to be enterprises and human capital by the state, businesses and other institutions, but we conceive of ourselves as such and act accordingly. We are now individuals or family units embroiled in an endless competition with one another. As Margaret Thatcher put it, there is no such thing as a society. There are individual men and women, and there are families. We are responsible for ourselves and only ourselves, and we can expect nothing from others but for them to seek to further their own self-interest, which often comes at the cost of our own, as they are little more than our competition. If we are to succeed, others must necessarily fail. We are thus endlessly seeking to improve our human capital to enhance our competitiveness, to ensure that we're ready for any eventuality and able to take on as much risk as possible, just as business do, what we choose to study or whether we choose to study at all, whether we are productive with our free time, whether we choose to get insurance or not, what types of insurance or companies and plans that we go with, what jobs we apply to, what job offers we take, when to leave a job, what eventualities we prepare for or don't. All of these are now not just decisions in one's personal life, but calculated risks that we take as enterprises in the society of the competitive market. 
As Dado and Laval put it, the figure of the citizen invested with a directly collective responsibility is gradually erased from the scene, giving way to entrepreneurial man. The latter is not only the sovereign consumer of neoliberal rhetoric, but the subject to which society owes nothing, the one who does not get something for nothing, and must work to earn more, to adopt some of the cliches of the new mode of government. The referent of state action is no longer the subject of rights, but a self-enterprising actor who enters into the most diverse private contracts with other self-enterprising actors. The enterprise is promoted to the rank of model of subjectification. Everyone is an enterprise to be managed and a capital to be made to bear fruit. This explains how neoliberalism has been so enduring, despite its often spectacular economic failures. It has always been about far more than just economics. It has fundamentally altered all aspects of society itself. It is thus unsurprising that, for example, the 2008 financial crisis did not result in any radical changes to neoliberal governance. After all, we've all been so thoroughly colonized by its prescriptions and the supposedly democratic options presented to voters are mostly just neoliberals with different branding, sometimes without the politicians themselves even realizing it. And since we now have an understanding of the fundamentals of neoliberal theory, we can see why that crisis was managed through massive bailouts for banks and financial institutions around the world, who funnily enough, through their poor risk assessment, had caused the crisis in the first place. Such intervention, at first glance, seems incredibly unfair, anti-competitive, and contradictory of the state's role under neoliberal doctrine. But, the alternative would have been the collapse of huge parts of the market, therefore, Keeping said institutions afloat was better for competition. Thus, the state actually perfectly fulfilled its principal theoretical role as the guarantor of the market. Material consequences for everyone else be damned. To finish up, I will attempt to provide a short and simple definition of neoliberalism that encapsulates everything that I've outlined here. Neoliberalism is an ideology that emphasizes the primacy of competition above all else within a capitalist market framework, and which seeks to extend said norm to all aspects of society and all actors within it. The state has a central role implementing and guarding this framework, and should also subject itself to the norm of competition in its own actions. A neoliberal would therefore be someone who approves of or propagates such norms, whether they label them themselves as such or not. It's important to remember that neoliberalism does not have a specific set of social values. Neoliberals can be conservative or, quote, socially progressive, unquote, or even something in between. Hence, for example, people who profess themselves to be anti-racist and pro-LGBT rights, but who also, say, demonize homeless people. The former two groups are, in of themselves, not incompatible with the competitive market order. In fact, their integration can actually be quite useful for for it. They are new categories for whom markets can be created or existing ones can be expanded to cater to. Homeless people, on the other hand, have either refused to participate in the market or tried and failed to eke out a living in it, making their near-universal derision in mainstream politics simply a logical consequence of neoliberal thought. If you're interested in learning more about the concepts outlined here, you should read the books that this video is based on. Firstly, The New Way of the World by Christian Lavelle and Pierre Dardot. Secondly, Never Let a Crisis Go to Waste by Philip Murawski. And lastly, though less importantly, A Brief History of Neoliberalism by David Harvey, which is a good resource for historical details, but one that you should maybe be a bit careful with, as Harvey fundamentally misunderstands neoliberal theory at many points. Hello folks, so this is me recording a video on my phone right after I've just gotten done editing the video that you just watched. This video took me about a month and a half to make in total between reading all those books, taking notes on them. I actually took about um, 10,000 words total of notes on those books and then I went over them all over again before I actually ended up starting to write the script. So yeah, and then I did additional research, then I wrote the script, I rewrote it a couple of times because I really wanted to make it as accessible as possible because this is kind of a sort of philosophical e sort of topic to cover. You know, so I wanted to make it as digestible as possible. 
Um, and then editing the actual video, putting everything together, you know, recording, um, basically doing what I'm doing now, but in front of a better camera and a better microphone. So yeah, I've wanted to make this video for a very long time, I, but I never got around to it. I always put it off because um, it is a very um, dense topic to cover and um, kind of cover properly. So glad it's finally out of the way. Took a lot of effort, but yeah. It's thanks to my supporters on Patreon that I'm able to make videos like this. So if you like my stuff and you'd like to see more of this sort of thing, head on over there and support me. I mean, if you're able to, that is. And even if you don't, thanks for watching anyway. See ya. Now I'd just like to thank all of my patrons, and especially my $25 plus patrons. Evan Carroll, Darcius B, Brosnan, Benny G, Dusty, Mischief and Fins, A Big Mean Cat, Pate, Shub, Jell Cribson, Jesse Hosick, and my $10 plus patrons. Christian Corniels, Esfer Pierre-Louis, Mira Kisses, Roja, Jackie T, Michael Strauss, JG, Jacob Pitts, Jesse Zaleski, Gillis Alcoin, Artemio Nelson, Insurgente, Cab the Burdened One, Crouton and Baguette, Young Trotsky, Morimer, One Trash Boy, Mamushin, Violet Rain, Cincione Bresgal, Industrial Robot, and Nico Del Sesto. Thanks for watching, bye!